can we go back to be prior to this to uh, when Einstein died, you know, the story of, of what happened to his brain? Einstein was living on borrowed time. And in this, he had an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And in the late 40s, I think 49, you know, they didn't have the vascular surgery in those days. So, but they did do um, abdominal surgery and they wrapped this big aneurysm with cellophane with the idea it would scar down and it wouldn't bleed. Um, Saran wrap, I hope. Yeah, I, 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 in 49, you, you, who knows? <laughs> but at any rate, they did that. And um, he managed until about 55, and he began having severe abdominal pains. And of course, that abdominal aortic aneurysm ruptured sometime in April of 1955. Uh, he was in the hot Princeton Medical Center, Princeton Hospital for several, several days. And on the morning, the early morning hours of April 18, he died. Uh, muttered a few words in German. The, the night nurse did not speak German, so we don't know what his last words were. At his bedside table were the notes that he had, as long as, long as he was um, able to think and work, he was still trying to figure out what's called the theory of everything. He was trying to reconcile general relativity and quantum physics. We still haven't done it, but that was what he did probably for the last 30 years of his life. Um, so his autopsy permission had been granted. It was more routine in the 50s. And in the early morning hours of April 18th, Thomas Harvey, who's the pathologist, does the autopsy. Can I stop you for a second? You bet. Autopsy permission was granted or, or was not granted? Autopsy the... permission was granted, yes. Yeah, there was a sign, except if you say, could I see that? It doesn't exist. The actual autopsy report from April 18th, 55, has been lost for decades. So I think, though, Harvey, he had to eventually confront the eldest son of Einstein, Hans Albert, and Otto Nathan, who was Einstein's executor. So I think it's very likely that, um, that there was an autopsy permit granted. Where it gets tricky is what happens after you determine the cause of death from the autopsy? What happens to the body? And in our case, this discussion is what happens to the brain? And that's a little more of a handshake deal. All I can tell you is Harvey did the autopsy, and when he opened the abdomen, he found that a lot of blood because the aneurysm had ruptured. But once he had established that, he incised the scalp, pulled out a bone saw, took off the top of the skull, grabbed Einstein's brain, severed the dura, severed the, the spinal cord, severed the carotid and vertebral arteries, and put it into form formaldehyde. Not only did he put it in formaldehyde, he actually infused formaldehyde through the, through the carotid arteries. Translation for people who are, and I'm not a pathologist, that ensures the best preservation of tissue to not only soak the, the, the structure in formal, formalin, but also to infuse it. So he did that, but he is off script. There is nothing, there is nothing about preserving any of the organs for further study. And in point of fact, Einstein had died that morning, and Einstein was taken for, for cremation. Again, that's not in the will, but somehow the family, um, the remaining uh, uh, daughter, um, maybe the, the son, Hans Albert, it was understood that he wanted to be cremated, and they took him to Ewing Crematorium. crematorium. And no one really knows where the ashes are scattered, but he was cremated. Um, they may have been scattered close by. Some people say that they were scattered a little bit in Lake Carnegie because he liked to sail there. But the missing link here is what happened to the brain. And the family reads the April 19th front page of the New York Times announcing the death of the greatest scientist, Albert Einstein, and it says the brain has been preserved for science. And the family goes, that's the first we ever heard of that. So Hans Albert the son and Otto Nathan, the executor, meet Harvey at Princeton Hospital, and Harvey makes the pitch of his life. And he says, you know, we will never get an opportunity to study the brain of, you know, an epical genius such as Albert Einstein. And the, the son went for it, and probably if Hans Albert went for it, Otto Nathan, the executor, had no choice but to go along. We really don't know. 
Um, to my knowledge, this was a handshake deal. There are documentaries that claim Dr. Krauss will say, I'm, I'm going to say Krauss, but I can't tell you for certain because in this documentary he presented himself as, quote, Dr. X, um, says that there is a signed permission slip. No one has ever seen it. It would be fascinating to see it. It would be more than fascinating. It would actually, in a sense, clear Harvey's name because there's this kind of urban myth about Harvey that he stole this brain. Yeah. Um, it was a different time in the 50s, and it was a handshake deal. And I believe when Harvey explained why the brain needed to be studied from the sincerest scientific reason that, um, uh, that Otto Nathan and Hans Albert said, we agree. And there's further evidence that they agreed because about 10 years later, Otto Nathan is sending very um, impatient letters to Harvey saying, you kept the brain to study and when are you going to publish an article? So I don't think you would be criticizing someone who stole the brain about why aren't you producing the work. So I, I'm pretty, I think Harvey legitimately, um, sincerely felt this was an unprecedented opportunity. The family did. And that's how the brain of Albert Einstein came into the scientific world.